prior surgery as opposed to just plain abscess. Just the abscess is encapsulated, doesn't spread. The, the abscess is encapsulated, plus in the ventricular system, the full ventricles are affected. Patients can get hydrocephalus. They can, the, the meningitis spreads all over, and it's by uh, continuous spread. So an encapsulated uh, abscess is much easier to treat. Antibiotics, you can follow it. But once it ruptures into the ventricle, there's really not a single place that you can, for instance, do surgery and clean it up because now everything's spread all over through the ventricular system. Thank you. Um, and epilepsy, it's not a neurosurgical emergency, but it's something that you guys see and we have to take care of too. Um, again, epilepsy is referred as a seizure disorder, and uh, it's recurrent unprovoked epileptic seizures. Um, there's different types of seizures, um, and depending on how you classify them, the origin of the seizure, there's many ways to see a seizure. And my, my talk is not about seizures, it's about the emergency of having someone in status. Um, first of all, they'll call you for the bell, they'll ring the, the tone, you have to go, someone's in seizure. The first thing you have to do is to make sure that the patient is away from anything that's sharp. Pad, put pillows around the bed. Most patients who are, have seizures, for seizure precautions, we pad their bed. So if they're in seizure, their status, they're not going to hurt themselves. If patients sitting up next to, next to the table, take the table out. Make sure that there's something soft next to the head so they're not banging against something else. Um, you have to put the patient onto their side. Most of these patients have uh, uh, vomit, and you have to make sure they don't aspirate. Okay? Uh, and then what you need to do is call for help. Have have someone come over, and, and I'll go over the protocol on how to stop a seizure. And the reason I'm saying, if you leave a patient by themselves, they can hurt themselves. So just staying next to the patient and calling for someone else to try and get the medications, to start IVs. And I have another uh, slide there that has more of a protocol of what to do. Again, by popular demand, don't put things in people's mouths. I've had so many patients where they put a pencil in their mouth because the whole thing is they're going to swallow their tongue and they're going to die. Nobody dies from swallowing the tongue unless you bite it off. But at the same time, if you shove something in their mouth, they're grinding out on their teeth. And if you open, first, you put your hand in there, they're going to cut your finger off. Second, if you put something sharp, for instance, a pencil, a pen, they're going to break it. If you have uh, a, a curl X, use the curl X. If not, don't do anything, okay? Don't put a wallet, don't put anything. Why? Because then the patient's going to hurt the, you and themselves more. Treatment of status. Um, does everybody need to be on Ativan? Well, uh, if, if you have a young kid, most of the times they treat them with uh, value and they do it per rectum. You don't have to use an IV or anything. Uh, again, I'm talking about status and I have a little graph later that how to treat them. First of all, Ativan, you have to be familiar with Ativan. The dosing in adults and pediatrics. And it's something you ha we have to know, everybody has to know how to give Ativan. You give it, you wait 15, 10 minutes, see how they're doing. Seizures don't stop like in the TV. You give it the push, the breaks a seizure. You have to just give it some time, it will stop. If it doesn't stop after 15 minutes, you can give another push. Pediatrics, again, if patient has an IV, you have an IV. If you don't have an IV, you have to start setting up an IV. Um, in a pediatric population, this is a dose. In adults, four milligrams. In children, you have to calculate by weight, or else you're going to cause respiratory depression. Why it's four milligrams? Why not just start with eight? Respiratory depression. If you give someone overdose of Ativan, you're going to need to start banging them and putting them into intubating them. Once you give the Ativan and you're waiting, you do the next step. You can give diglantin or phosphenitoin. They're the same thing, but diglantin is, uh, phosphenitoin is easier to give. It's very important to know that uh, the loading dose of diglantin is not a push. If you push a uh, you know, thousand milligrams, this is the, which 50 milligrams per minute. If you push a thousand milligrams, you're going to cardiovert the patient. You're going to put him in AFib. I had someone who in AFib, they cardiovert him which is great, but that wasn't what we're trying to do, because you can hurt patients. It, this is one of the drugs you have to make me familiar that it is not a push. You have to give it 50 milligrams per minute. The easiest way to do it, dilute it. Put it in a bag and just set it on a pump. 
Again, while you're doing the Ativan, this is the next step you should be doing, loading up the patient. Postphenytoin is easier to give, and you can see 100 milligram per minute, so it's much easier to give. But again, not even uh, phosphatidine, cerebrate is something you can push. If the patient doesn't stop seizing, then we have to go to anesthetics, propofol, phenobarbital. And, and why do we have to do this? Well, I have a little graph here, and somehow my slide, can you see it in your, it's kind of blurry here. And, I, I, you know, what you do, patients start seizing. Make sure that the patient is able to ventilate. <coughs> the nasal cannula is important. If you have one, put it in. Check blood pressure, oxygen. Monitor an EKG and the respirations. Check the temperature. Obtain the history. Again, usually it's, what happens is, patient comes from the ER, nobody knows anything about the patient, we don't know what's wrong with them. So we have to kind of assess the patient. Uh, samples of, of serum, of blood, why? Because one of the most common causes of seizures is hypoglycemia. So there's many things that you can treat. You don't have to give these patients Ativan or anything else. Just give them some glucose and wait. The problem is you have to have an IV, IV set up. So that's the next step. Start setting up an IV. When you give glucose, you have to follow it with thiamine and folate. It's very important. All alcoholics, if you give glucose before thiamine and folate, you're going to have other problems, neurologic deficits. Corsicos encephalopathy and Warnakine encephalopathy are all associated alcoholics when you don't give them the vitamins that they need. And then what happens, do we have EEG techs here? Mm -hmm. You are an EEG tech? No, oh, we're, we're, we're not in the room. We have, <laughs> we have some hospital. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. Do we have them like 24-7? Can we call them? No. No, it's more of a scheduling thing. It's someone who comes from one of the offices. Okay, so then we have to call and schedule it for a day. <laughs> um, again, administering Ativan. Uh, the dose of Ativan I gave you, check it. See how the patient's doing the first dose. I always say if you have to do more than two doses, you're going to have trouble with ventilating the patient. You're going to have respiratory distress. You can give up to 12 milligrams on the floor, but the problem is respiratory depression. At that time, you should be already setting up the patient to go down to the ICU or have the anesthesiologist or the cold team come in for the intubation. Again, bladder catheter, temperature. Phenobarbital would be the next thing. I would give in this one, and if you look at the newer, they also include Keppra because now Keppra is IV. So you can do phosphenitoin or Keppra, and you can start loading these patients on. And then I would use propofol first. To me, it's much easier to use propofol because for the neurologic patient, you stop the propofol, you can reassess. The patient still seizing, just crank up on the propofol. The problem with propofol, hypotension. So you can't always give it. But the same thing happens if you give someone uh, phenobarbital, you'll cause hypotension. Any questions on seizures? Okay. Recovery position. Put the patient on the side. Uh, again, you're. Nothing in the mouth, just make sure that the patient doesn't hurt themselves because they're going to start having, and usually the tonic-clonic patients are the ones who hurt themselves. If they have obstinate seizure or any other type of seizure with lip smacking, they're not going to hurt themselves. These are the seizures that are tonic-clonic. Again, here I have a little diagram of how a seizure works. First you have a focus. This focus is causing cortical irritation, excites the brain, and what happens, it causes uh, like a vicious cycle. It starts stimulating other parts of the brain and then you can see as it goes off and off and off. That's why you have a general seizure, a tonic-clonic seizure. Certain other seizures, for example, temporal lobe seizures, patients have less of a lip smacking, uh, abnormal smells, so depending on what part of the brain is where the focus is, that would be the presentation. Next one. Um, these are more of post-neurosurgical cases. Uh, Post-op neck hematomas. One of the, the simplest surgery that neurosurgeons do is a ACDF. Everybody gets an ACDF. It's a very simple procedure, very low morbidity, but carotid artery is right there, jugular vein is right there, esophagus is here, trachea is there. We have to go in through this natural corridor, and it's just by splitting it open, and you get to the spine. Okay. When you do the discectomy, you go in, you drill off the disc. Put a little bone dowel and plate and screws. That's it. 
The problem is, if the patient would, and it usually happens if they're having, and, it, and I usually see it, to me it happened where someone was on ginkgo biloba. It's not a blood thinner, but it is a not blood thinner. It's not on the blood thinner things now. And now you should always make sure that everybody is off all the herbal supplements. Some herbal supplements are blood thinners. So post-op neck hematoma, surgery went well, patients a thin neck, they're doing fine, had one, em one emesis. After the emesis, the patient was having neck pain. Everybody gets neck pain, they had neck surgery. Not really, ACDFs don't really hurt that much. If you compare a back fusion versus an ACDF, ACDF, the patient says, my throat hurts and I've got a little pain down my scapula. That's normal because you're distracting the facet joints in the back. But patients don't really complain of a lot of neck pain. If you start having a patient that says, I have a lot of neck pain, the morphine is not helping, you have to make sure that the patient is breathing properly. Don't just, by reflex, because it's usually there, keep SATs greater than 92, titrate the oxygen. Because what's starting to happen is, if there is a post-op neck hematoma, it's pushing away the trachea. And the patient's already starting to give you signs and symptoms that he can't breathe by himself. So if you crank off the oxygen, we're not gonna diagnose this until it's too late. So uh, this picture, this is what we usually do, ACDF, actually this was a perfectum, but it's the plate which was here. This is the hematoma right here. On a plain x-ray you can see it. The trachea is pushed forward. The trachea should be right here. It's pushed forward. This is a big emergency because it's pushing away and here you can see the trachea closes off here. It's putting pressure on the trachea. So what happens here is if you're concerned, call. Post-op neck hematomas can kill someone. Why? You can't intubate these patients. You need to do a tracheostomy. The trachea is deviated and compressed, so no ET tube will go down. You have to do a tracheostomy. What, I, what you need to do is contact the neurosurgeon, and what I do is just, at the bedside, get a couple forceps and open up the wound so the hematoma pops out. It's a quick thing, yes, it's not sterile, but that will save a patient's life. So these are one of the few things that we can pick up, and the sooner we pick it up, the better prognosis for our patient. Any question in this? This is something that, that really happens. It's not one of those, oh, you know, if you ever see one. Statistically, it happens in 1% of patients. That it causes tracheal deviation, it's 0 0.3. But if a post-op hematoma is starting to give some symptoms, that's an emergency. Don't wait it out. The other one is a post-operative spinal hematomas. If someone gets a fusion, uh, posterior fusion, uh, again, I'm talking of below the neck, post-op neck hematomas don't, will, in the lower spine won't give you problems with respiration. You will just start having other problems. Urine retention, patient can't void. That's why I order some protocols in the, ice, in, the, in, the, in the floor about bladder scan. Why? Because after spine surgery, you can have a hematoma. And if the bladder is not working properly, there's a problem. Can it be associated to the surgery? Yes. Narcotics anesthesia can cause urine retention, but it shouldn't cause urine incontinence or complete retention where the patient can work. The next thing is changes in their exam. That's why it's so important to get an exam, a baseline exam. When someone gets out of surgery, you have to check the patient. And what I always say is, Look at the note too, because if someone had a baseline exam in the HMP, it should be there. And it will say four over five on the right side, the left side was five over five. So you can compare at least what the baseline is. Because I'm, again, calling is not an issue. But if you can check and see, oh, this is the same exam, I don't need to call at three in the morning. But if you don't know, it's safer to ask. In the HMP, it should always say the exam, the baseline exam. Um, sharp pain. Patients say, oh, I'm having excruciating pain. Yes, you had back surgery, but usually the pain after spine surgery is more of spasms in the back and complete discomfort by moving. They shouldn't be, without moving, having severe shooting pain. Um, the pain should have improved after surgery. And the pain usually is referred to radicular. Radicular means like a sciatica type pain. Everybody says sciatica, but it's not. It's a shooting pain that goes in a specific distribution. Depending on the location, big toe is L5, lateral part of the foot is S1. Depending on the location would be the distribution of the pain that the patient would have. Um, again, bladder dysfunction. If you start seeing urine output, don't automatically say, oh, he hasn't, he ha he, let's give him more fluids. No. You have to make sure.